Hi, my name is Mike Gaiman, and welcome to episode 11. Um, what you see here is Junk Sat 6. And if you recall from a couple of episodes ago, a couple of episodes ago, excuse me, um, I had another satellite mission, which was to attach a DP-10 antenna and reach certain orbital parameters. And uh, you may recall that I, I lost said antenna when that antenna was connected to the ascent stage as opposed to um, the satellite itself. So that, that mission didn't work out. So here I am uh, trying it again. And uh, as I finish off my, my burn to reach the appropriate orbital parameters, although all those parameters go green, in the past with these types of missions, I've then got it, gotten a countdown uh, to the appropriate amount of time, and as you can see here, I don't get that countdown, and that that confused me for uh, for quite a bit. Um, and I thought, oh man, it's, it's somehow this thing just royally messed up. Um, and and so anyway, I, I had nothing else to do. I just ended up leaving it and going it to some, going to something else. And as soon as I did that, I ended up seeing that the contract did get fulfilled. I guess just somehow the timer just got messed up because this was my second try at this particular contract. I don't know. But anyway, I did get the contract on this one. But as you will see with this episode, this turns out to be an episode full of um, mistakes and mishaps. Some of them minor and some of them not so much. And here we are back at the Kerbal Space Center. And what I'm interested in doing is seeing if I have enough reputation to push my fundraising campaign up to uh, 50%. And I don't know about other people, but I can't make heads nor tails of that reputation gauge that's up at the top. I can't figure out what number that's trying to say my reputation is at. So the only thing I can figure to do is to pick one of these strategies that I'm not really that interested in and just move the gauge up until the, it tells me that I don't have enough reputation to go to that particular percentage. And then I know that, well, okay, my reputation must be a little bit less than that number. Uh, that seems a little bit annoying. <laughs> There's got to be a better way to do it than that. But anyway, I did figure out that I do have enough reputation. So here I am. I'm going to upgrade the um, the administration building so that I can now uh, I can go up to 100 you, 100% commitment on these, but I'm only going to go up to 75. So I delete my old fundraising campaign, then create a new fundraising campaign, uh, put it up to 50%. So now 50% of my reputation that I earn goes to generating more money, and 25% still goes, the, another 25% goes to uh, generating science. And then I'll see what to do with that last 25% uh, later on, depending upon my needs. So, moving on, we come to MapSat 1. Now, just to sort of change this launch up a little bit, I put the camera in uh, chase mode just to make things, I don't know, more interesting might be too strong a word, but at least different. And uh, the mission here is to go into a polar orbit with an altitude of 250 kilometers and deploy some mapping equipment that comes from the ScanSat mod that I will show you how it works once we get it up there. Um, so. Th this thing is fulfilling one of these custom contracts that, that you can make with the Mission Controller 2 mod. And the idea with these custom contracts, I've used them before, I used them for the uh, communication satellites that I put up, is you can just specify an orbit, uh, well actually you specify an orbital period range, and then if you hit that particular orbital period range, you, you, you get some reputation and some cash. So, so it's, uh, you know, you can get paid a little bit for these, these satellites that you you put up even though they're not part of the game uh, contracts. So here I know I want a circular polar orbit with an altitude of 250 kilometers and I worked out that at 250 kilometers that gives me an orbital period of 44 minutes or about 44 minutes so I set the range to be between 46 and 42. Now you might be if you're looking over at the right there between 46 and 42 might be your first hint that I did do something wrong here. And we'll cut to me just finishing off this circularization. And <clears throat> according to engineer, of course, I do have the period that I need to have. It's in the range that I want, yet my orbital parameter 
for the contract is not going green. So yeah, something is wrong, but I decide, you know what, I'll, I'll wrap my head around this later. Why don't we take a look at the equipment that's on this satellite and get it deployed. So there are two pieces of equipment on this satellite. One is a multispectral analyzer or something like that. And the other is a radar altimeter. And both of them come from the ScanSat mod. So the spectral analyzer, um, maps biomes for you. So you get this nice biome map that I will show you and it becomes better of course as it maps around. And the um, radar altimeter is uh, uh, just gives you a uh, altitude map, a relief map. Uh, and both of these look really great as you deploy them. This one here is the radar altimeter now. And uh, yeah, they look really nice. And we'll go to the map view here which you can see takes a bit to render, but we'll just speed right past that. You can see down there towards the bottom right what we've mapped so far. That's what's coming from the altimeter. We'll take a look at the what's coming from the multispectral analyzer, uh, which is showing us the biomes there. That, that's showing us a biome. We're, we're over some grasslands right now. If you hover over parts that you've mapped, it'll tell you what biome it is, what altitude, what the slope's like down there, if you're thinking of landing down that way. So lots of useful information. Um, you can also see our projected orbit being shown there as well. And as the satellite maps around, it'll begin to fill it in. It also gives you some science. As, as you fill that in, you're, you can go back here and you can get some science. Now, I was thrown a little bit because it also should be show, giving me a Kerbinite view. I do have the Kerbinite mod. I haven't talked about it yet, and I won't talk about it much now. But it gives you some resources for you to, uh, to mine. But I didn't see the option to see... Kerbinite, and then I started to realize, you know what, I bet you uh, I didn't install the mod. I must have just missed it. And if I look back, that's exactly what did happen. I did end up missing that mod. And in case you may not have guessed it by now, I the reason why my orbital parameter didn't work is because I messed up when it came to uh, setting the period. I set the maximum period to be 42 uh, minutes and the minimum period to be 46 minutes. And it doesn't take much to realize, well, that's kind of impossible. So I really messed up that contract. So I had to delete it and then I had to restart it again. And, you know, actually it's going to work out okay because the Kerbinite has parts for scanning for Kerbinite, which I should have realized weren't there. And, and noticed that uh, at that point that I hadn't had the mod installed. So uh, I'm going to have to set up another one with the Kerbinite detectors on there anyway, and that'll be in a future episode, and by then I'll have that contract worked out correctly. So in the end, it'll all work out. And now on to something new. This is the Archimedes, our next generation of jet aircraft. Uh, the Archimedes uh, it has much more efficient engines at higher altitudes, so that means it can reach a higher cruising speed. It can also has a lot more fuel. It can comfortably circumnavigate Kerbin, and as you can see, it has two crew. We have our pilot Enfrod and our science Bil scientist Bilney aboard. Uh, but all that does come at an expense. This thing is uh, over three times the mass of the uh, of the uh, Aristarchus, so it takes a little bit longer to get going, but uh, it certainly does look good doing it. Look at those uh, those uh, thrusting effects coming from those engines. By the way, this uh, craft is mostly built out of B9 aerospace parts. There is a fair amount of overlap now between the B9 parts and the stock space plane parts. A lot of the parts uh, are, are replicated. So I had to kind of make a decision which way to go to kind of save on my part count. And I decided to go with the B9. So I've deleted a lot of the stock space plane parts that end up kind of just replicating uh, what this thing does. Now, uh, why why did I do that? Well, number one, just look at this thing. I mean, it, it, it's it's freaking gorgeous. Look at the flames coming out of the uh, out of the engines and and things like that. So, and, I, and I'm also used to the B9 parts a little bit more. I've been I've, I've used them through a couple of campaigns, so I'm used to using them. 
Uh, number two is in the later stages of the game, B9 comes with some truly epic parts that uh, I definitely want to use that, that have no counterpart in the stock space plane parts. And number three, I mean, just take a look at this interior. This interior is gorgeous. I mean, we have a map being rendered there on the left, thanks to ScanSat, which has now been up for a, a couple of days. Um, we got this great uh, uh, flight display right smack there in the center. I'll bring up the resources over here on the right. We also can we have some external cameras. I not I don't I not only have the um, external camera that I mark that I uh, <laughs> mounted on the bottom of the fuselage, but it also comes with. Uh, its own built-in cameras uh, that um, and you can aim the cameras around which is something you can't do with the, with the the other ones uh, and look at look at it's got that great abort big red abort button there which obviously I will stay away from we have our, our map view we get we can switch it over to uh, to uh, take a look at the slope view or to the biome view whichever sort of meets our fancy. We can zoom in on it a little bit as well, which is great. It also shows your trajectory as you fly around. Oh, i got to do a little bit of adjustments. It's nice that you can fly this whole thing um, just from the interior if you really wanted to. There's nothing to stop you. In fact, there's quite a way, in some ways, more useful information looking at the inside than there is uh, looking at the outside. we got all our buttons here over to the side. We can control everything. Uh, got this nice uh, interior cockpit light button. That's just nice touches, stuff like that. Over on the right, we have uh, buttons for all of our control groups, which of course don't work at all because I've yet to upgrade the space plane hangar enough to be able to use control groups. All in all, just a really gorgeous job. You can spend a lot of time just playing around in here. Okay, so Archimedes. Let's talk a little bit about Archimedes. Archimedes was a 3rd century BC mathematician, engineer. I don't know if you could call him a scientist given the term really didn't exist at that time. I guess probably the others didn't either, really, when you come to think of it. Um, you know, and, and really, there are about four sort of historical mathematician, scientist type people that just their their what they did and their personal stories and their personal struggles just intrigue me and Archimedes is absolutely one of them. Um, sorry, uh, maybe all you Euclid fans, but to me Archimedes was the greatest of the of the Greek mathematicians. I mean, just his calculation of the number pi and how he did it. I would strongly encourage you to YouTube that. I'm not going to talk about it now, but his use of infinitesimals. I mean, it is within a hair's breadth of being calculus. He really is using the reasoning that people like Newton and Leibniz would be using, you know, almost two millennia later in order to 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 work out the value for pi. Um, his work with conics, his works with uh, uh, exponentiation, um, and, and not only that, he was a he was a brilliant engineer. I mean, he built things. His work with his with hydrostatics, you know, that's where he got that eureka moment. He's the guy with the eureka story, running out of his bathtub after uh, after uh, d uh, discovering the principle of buoyancy uh, with levers and pulleys and pumps. He built all kinds of machines. I mean, I I don't think you can overstate the brilliance of this particular man. And and the story he's probably the most remembered for is the story around his death. Um, he was from Syracuse and he was heavily involved in the siege of Syracuse by the Romans. And uh, the stories um, of the machines that he built to hold off the Romans uh, or beyond, you know, almost beyond belief. Well, some of them are beyond belief. The, 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 the famous story of him uh, using parabolic reflectors to, to uh, set you know, use the sun's energy to burn Roman ships. That 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 almost for sure couldn't happen because it just, it just people have tried to do it. It just doesn't work. It doesn't really make sense. And those stories didn't start till a few centuries after his death. So they're, they're almost for sure made up. But some of his other stories, his catapults, his his um, 
is as other machines of war, the stories of using giant levers with hooks on them to upend Roman ships, uh, those are far more credible and just about as amazing. Um, his death, there's a number of stories around his death. The most, most often told one is that the uh, he, there were orders not to have him killed, but a ignorant Roman soldier found him not knowing who he was, and Archimedes was so obsessed with his work that he told the soldier off and all, all for all intents and purposes, and the soldier killed him for it. Um, what actually happened, of course, is, is lost in time, but that is a great story. Well, on to the mission then. Okay, the, the mission's the usual. I've got a couple of them, and they're couple of contracts here and the, the missions are the, the the usual assortment of you know uh altitude temperature and pressure scans and crew reports and some on the surface so here what we're doing is we're heading in um towards one of those surface uh scans that i gotta do and i i have to be exceedingly careful um again as i mentioned this this craft is is three more than three times heavier than aristarchus so it, it, it's going to hit the ground you know, with a little bit more force than that one does. It's also not quite up to what I like yet. I don't I don't have the really good control surfaces that come with B9 unlocked yet, so I have the stop control surfaces, especially the Aerleons on the wings. Um they're the little ones are they're almost hidden completely in the in the wing texture, so those aren't quite working right. I also have the stock landing gear. Uh, B9 come with some comes with some heavier landing gear, which can take a little bit more force. Than, than the stock ones do. So I'm, I'm gonna be exceedingly careful. And in fact, here I am, I'm coming into a one particular spot that I was thinking of landing at, and uh, I'm starting to realize, no, no, the ground is is uh, coming up too quickly up ahead, so, so I aborted on that one, turned around a little bit, picking another spot that looks reasonably flat, but as careful as I am, I'm just not careful enough. And when I touch the ground, that right uh, starboard landing gear, it just, it just buckles under the force. And yeah, this is over pretty quick. Yeah, and as you undoubtedly surmised, um, Bilney and Enfrod did not survive this crash, and yeah, killing Kerbals always kind of bums me out. I hate I hate when this happens, but uh, you know it's 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 part of the game, and and then you get this extra kick in the teeth from uh, Mission Controller too. You get this message: uh, death of hero. Well, I guess it's supposed to be death of a hero. The Kerbal named Bilney Kerman has died in the line of duty. This is a tragic loss, and will cost you twenty thousand funds. Bilney will be remembered by the Kerbal people as a hero who tho, well, thought of Kerbal kind before his own. We send him to the darkness in which we are all born to regain the spark of life. I think the uh, the, the rationale that they give is that, that th this is uh, an insurance payment. Um, I kind of like to think that they're paying off the press myself, but uh, that's just me. But we have no more time to mourn the loss of Bilney and Enfrod because right on the heels of the Archimedes we have Muna 3. Now I was all set to be doing one of these kind of dull lunar insertion orbit things and then it's when I popped the hood that I realized, oh wait a second, there's a parachute there and this thing has landing gears and oh, oh this is a lander. Oh now I remember, <laughs> I remember building this thing now. Uh, yeah, that's the thing with... Uh, with, uh, you know, putting things in the building queue and then not being able to launch it for a while. Sometimes you forget what you built. So the, the idea here, this is a land and return mission. We're going to land on the moon and then we're going to bring the science back with us. So let's take a little bit closer look at this vehicle. On the bottom here, we have our transfer stage. And if I have this set up right, um, the idea here is there's enough fuel to transfer to the moon, achieve a low orbit... And then, when the fuel runs out, I should be at the suborbital part of my descent. So when I detach, hopefully this thing, the, the transfer stage, will just crash into the moon's surface and be gone. Again, remember, I, I, I really hate debris, so hopefully this thing won't leave any debris behind. And then the lander will obviously land, but should have enough fuel to get itself back to Kerbin and we should be able to recover all the science that way. Um, so here come, here's the plan. The plan is to insert ourselves into a pr low 
prograde orbit. Okay, that's what we want to do. And it's good to come around prograde so that you are rotating in the same direction as the moon is rotating. That makes the fuel requirements to land a little bit less. Now for the moon, the moon rotates really slowly. So it's actually not a big deal to go around retrograde as well. It doesn't make a big difference. And in fact, the Apollo missions went around retrograde. And the reason they did that is because if something went wrong, like it did with Apollo 13, uh, remember, coming around retrograde gives you that, um, that gravity assist to uh, reduce the amount of energy in your orbit and bring you back home. So they had it set up so that they had a free return. So if anything went wrong and they had to abort, they can use the moon's gravity to get them back, which turned out to be a good thing and actually saved the lives of the crew of Apollo 13. And, and, and while I'm talking about gravity assists, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I was thinking back to what I talked about last episode, talking about, uh, I did a kind of a long rambling on gravity assists, and uh, I, I was using the words east and west a lot, and I realized now, looking at it, that it's, it's, it was, I was kind of confusing, like, I was talking about east and west, as in the east side of the moon and the west side of the moon, as looking from uh, Kerbin, and I, but I was talking about east and west as if they're absolute directions in space, which of course they're not. And in fact, when talking about directions on the celestial sphere, so to speak, when you're looking up at the sky, it's more typical to have west on the right and east on the left. So I might have been kind of confusing with my use of east and west, so I'm going to simplify this right now. Since all the objects in Kerbal Space Program all the planets and moons, they all rotate in a prograde direction, which is a little different than real life. Uh, for instance, Venus rotate, rotates around retrograde, but in Kerbal Space Program, they all rotate around prograde. So why don't I use the words prograde and retrograde to describe you know, when you get a gravity boost and when you get a gravity, uh, you're using gravity to slow yourself down. And it's when you go on a hyperbolic trajectory around an object, in a prograde direction that you get the boost and when you go on a hyperbolic trajectory in a retrograde direction you the gravity assist will slow you down so hopefully that clarifies things a little bit and I should also mention and you may have already noticed this that um, uh, you can see this a number of the satellites I've launched in the past are now gone I've been deorbiting the ones that I can just to sort of keep my skies clear I like clean skies and uh, I have not been deleting them, I've just been deorbiting them. In fact, there's one that remains, and that is the first one, JunkSat 1. And the reason why that guy's stuck up there in orbit is because, well, its batteries are completely dead. So, uh, yeah, maybe one day I'll send somebody up there when I have more tech to, uh, to bring that thing back down. And with our burn complete, it's time to just uh, wait for this thing to get out there to the moon. But given what time we're at with this episode, I think I'm going to have to put that off until... The next episode, because right now the Aristarchus is all set and ready to go. And at the controls, we have our dependable pilot, Tom Plock. Um, and the mission here is to is to finish the missions that Archimedes couldn't do because, well, it crashed. And, and to be honest, the Aristarchus is much better equipped for these shorter flights and these landing landings on rougher terrains. So I think in the future I will keep using this plane for these types of missions and save the Archimedes for longer flights, like for instance, landing at the ice caps or perhaps going to the Badlands, which is on a different continent. It's much better equipped for those types of missions. So we will, you know, all of these uh, contracts went without a hitch, so I'm just, I'm not going to show them all to you. And instead, we saved our final landing for uh, the crash site of the Archimedes. So I figure it would be appropriate if Tom Plock went out here and planted a flag in a bit of a memorial. And so we'll name this the Archimedes crash site in memory of Enfraud and Bilney. And with that, we will bring this episode to a close, and we will see you next time.